Greetings and welcome. My name is Karen Sturk and I'm the CEO of the Jeanette Rankin Foundation. Thank you for joining us today. We provide scholar grants and support to women who, with financial aid, a, a need who are over the age of 35 and are pursuing a post-secondary degree. To date, we've given over 1,000 scholarships in the amount of $3.8 million. We were started with a bequest from Jeanette Rankin's Georgia estate. And if you don't know who Jeanette Rankin is, she was the first female in Congress elected in 1916 and the only woman to vote on giving women the vote. When she left Congress, she lived in Georgia for 50 years and the bequest from her estate provided the funds to start the Jeanette Rankin Foundation. Today, we've got two very special people to share their wisdom and experience with you. Latrina Artist is our scholarship program director and Kat Luna is our scholarship program manager. Both of them are JRF alumni and have walked that road. So I'm gonna turn it over to Latrina who briefly will talk. She does have a cold and um, a little bit challenged with her voice. So Latrina, take it away. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. And please forgive my voice, but hey, the most important thing is you're gonna get some amazing information today from our very own, own Kat Luna. Again, my name is Latrina Artis. I am the scholarship program director here at the Jeanette Rankin Foundation. And I'm delighted that you all are here today. And I'll now turn it on over to Kat so you don't have to be uh, butchered by my voice today. Thank you, Latrina. And thank you, Karen. I'm so excited to be here today. Uh, Karen winked a little bit and so did Latrina that um, we're both past scholars. And so the Jeanette Rankin Foundation is an amazing foundation that offers scholarships or scholar grants to uh, women over 35. So I just want to talk to you today a little bit about time management for non-traditional students. And um, hopefully you take away some strategies that will help you on your journey in life and also uh, in pursuing an education. So uh, go ahead and go to the next slide and we'll take it away. <laughs> so a little bit of what we'll cover today, uh, just a quick, quick review, we'll just go over an introduction of time management, what it is. We're going to talk about some of the problems in managing your time and how to detect those problems. We'll talk about procrastination and strategies to help prevent procrastination. It's a tough one, but we all probably could use some help. Uh, we're going to go over planning time, very important goal setting and to-do list, and then we'll go ahead and just talk away, uh, talk about some takeaways. So next slide. So what is time management? And very simply put, it's using time available to you effectively in order to get the task done. And to really think about what time management really is, what, what it is is, I'm, heard, I'm sure you've heard the, the phrase like, you know, time is a construct that we've created. But what time management really is, is it's, it's mind management. We use our minds to be able to break down things throughout our day, tasks throughout our day, to get things done. And in order to really do that effectively, it takes a lot of skill building and, and we have to use our, our minds to be able to really um, effectively do that. So Let's go ahead and just dive in a little bit more about how that looks um, throughout our, our day to day. So go ahead, next slide. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about some myths about time management. One of them is that uh, it's common sense. And that is definitely not true. Uh, just because you do well in school or maybe in other various uh, aspects of your life doesn't mean that you're you're really managing your time effectively. I know a lot of people, myself, uh, that had uh, you know really great results in um, in accomplishing my tasks in school, but it was really stressful. And so um, I didn't really get to to tell you guys, but I just graduated um, just this 
this last spring. And there were a lot of, um, there was a lot on my plate. I'm a single mom of three kiddos. And so I thought, you know, I was really doing a great job at tackling some of those assignments, but I just didn't really have a whole lot of free time. And I just felt really drained a lot of the time. And, and that just largely went into me not really knowing how to manage and effectively, um, you know, utilize my time. So another myth is that it takes all the fun out of life managing your time. And that's just not true at all. In fact, the more you learn to manage your time effectively, the more time you'll have to do fun things. And then I like this on time management. I work better under pressure. That is, it's just the farthest thing from the truth. When we are are tapping into that part of our brain that that is under pressure, it's the fight or flight part of our brain. It's we our amygdala gets hijacked and it sends a response to our hippocampus that um that creates a stress response this fight or flight mode and it and it does it gets stuff done so when we're running from an animal trying to eat us or attack us we we are great at getting that that task done but when you're talking about being under pressure all the time and when you're um triggering that response that stress response all the time you actually don't work well under pressure. What happens is that you go under this um, kind of chronic stress day to day, and then it really inhibits our ability to tap into that logical reasoning part of our brain that's able to kind of calmly work through tasks. So the more we manage our time, actually the better we'll get at, at being able to kind of bring that stress down and really effectively manage um, our day to day without feeling that pressure. So, and then no matter what I do, I won't have enough time. And I really want, want you guys to sit with the language and, and really think about the language that you use in your day-to-day -day life in creating a relationship with time. And that sounds kind of weird because time isn't like a person we're not having a relationship with, but our relationship that we have tied to our time throughout the day I want you to really start thinking about how you can make it more positive. So when we think about the way we we talk to our, our friends, I was just telling my one of my sisters the other day, like, oh, gosh, don't, don't I know like how much time that takes? I never have enough time to do that thing. And I thought about it after the fact. And I was like, you know, I don't need to use that kind of language as much anymore. I just need to start strategizing how, how to, I guess, think of it in a more positive light. So um, next slide. So the truth about time management, so we talk about some myths. Uh, the truth is that it, it really increases productivity. I mean, we are able to do so much more with our time when we're utilizing it more effectively. It reduces stress when we use time management. It also improves our self-esteem because we're able to see how much we actually get done. It's really a boost of confidence to be able to strategize and see that you're you're hitting goals and you, your planning worked and everything's running smoothly. Um, it helps achieve balance in life. We all have so much on our plate. I don't want to assume about each and every one of your lives, but I'm pretty sure that all of us have a lot on our plates right now. And especially when you're going back to school or when you're in school currently. And so um, finding that balance really is important and time management can help do that. It increases your self-confidence and it helps you reach your goals all great things. So go ahead, next slide. <laughs> all right, so first we're gonna start with how to diagnose some of the problems that you have. And to do this really more effectively, we wanna analyze kind of where, where, we're, where we're wasting our time, what, what we have on our plates. So we use what's called the RAC method and it's record, analyze, and change. And so in the chat, um, we're, we're, there's a, a checklist that you guys can download off of our website to really do this. And I encourage each of you to take time, not, not right at this moment, but take some time to really break down, use this checklist and this kind of worksheet and break down what it is that you do in your day. And when I say what you do in your day, I mean everything. There, there's a pie chart in this um, worksheet and you can really, there's 24 pies, pieces of the pie, really break down exactly what you do every day. So when you wake up in the morning, write, write down what you do when you first get up in your morning routine. Do you go straight to make coffee? Do you take, you know, a half hour to, to do makeup or to take a shower, whatever it is, 
just track every single thing down. And it's even useful to do this in during the weekend too, because weekends change, weekdays change, and your routine changes. Maybe you have um, kiddos and the time with them changes a little bit, or even joint custody if you have a partner and and um, you have to divide that time up. Really look at what your your day entails, track that down, and then look at where you can optimize that. So we're just gonna watch a quick video of um, the record analyze change method and kind of get an idea of how to use it. So go ahead and start the video there. Effectively. Today, we are going to help you take control of your day with the RAC method, recording, analyzing, and changing three easy steps to great time management. Pause and print a copy of the RAC handout that accompanies this lesson. Okay, let's go. Step one, recording. When you wake up tomorrow, note the time in your day planner and as the day progresses, write down everything you do. Yes, we mean everything. Keep this up from the time you wake up until you go to sleep. Step two, analyzing. At the end of the day, go through the schedule and highlight any chunks of time that you don't feel were used productively. Pick out your five biggest time wasters. Add up all the time you wasted. Step three, changing. Now it's time to get that time back. Here are three ways to change your time wasting habits and become a better time manager. One, prioritize. To-do lists are a really effective way to manage your time and priorities. Limit the number of tasks on the list to five and assign rankings to them in order of importance. Two, declutter. Don't waste time looking for things. Decluttering saves time. Three, schedule. Multitasking isn't the way to go. It will just stress you out and delay you even more. Instead, set aside blocks of time for individual activities. For each activity, set start and stop points. This way, your day is clearly segmented. Stick to this schedule. Try going one week using these tips to reduce your wasted time. At the end of the week, go figure out where you've improved your time management skills and see how much time you've saved. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, I did not do this when I was uh, in my undergrad as as effectively, I guess I didn't use a worksheet and I didn't really see where I was losing all that time. I knew it was happening, but I didn't, I didn't actually do it. And so, um, I'm a visual learner. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but, I, and I also need to do very tactile. So being able to really track this down and actually, I actually did this recently. I looked at where my time was and I thought, man, I keep thinking I have all these really neat ideas about projects that I'd like to, to start and try out. And, um, and I have so much more, so much more availability than I actually thought I did when I really start to eliminate some of those and prioritize. So I really want you to try this out, really evaluate what it is that you're doing. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later in the presentation, but a lot of what you're doing, we, we kind of, you know, I was mentioning is that it's, it's mind management. It's really thinking about what's important to you. And when we prioritize things that are important to us, our, our values are attached to that. So we need to really think about what is important to us. What do we, what do we really want? What do we love in our life? And what do we want to do? And, and so it needs to resonate with you. So when you create your plan, really think about some of those things that you're doing and what you want to do and why they're important to you and, and use that as a motivator. So then uh, while you're evaluating, I want you to really think about how, how you're actually using your time and what were you actually able to accomplish in that? So when you're breaking down some of those tasks and in that video, it talked about five tasks, that number of prioritizing things and putting them on the top of your list is really crucial. You wanna make sure that the top things on your list are really the most important things that you just have to get done. And then when you look at what you didn't get done, Think about how you're feeling about your productivity. You know, what was the energy level right for what you were really putting your efforts into for those prioritized tasks? Um, what was your stress level like? If your stress level was really high getting those things done and, and now 
your stress level is a lot lower now that you got those things done. It's like just feeling good that you can check those things off the list. Really like think about when you go through and you move through your day, how good that feels to have those high stress things off your, off your list, or even throughout the week. If you have a, a weekly to-do list and you get those top things done that are just really super stressful for you, and you can just spend the rest of your week relaxing, it's a reward system. And it really does tell your brain that that's a, it's a good feeling to get those things done. So try to do more of those things that, to just knock them out, out, out of your way, even if they feel like they're, they're stressful and, and there's more pressure on you immediately, over time, it'll get much, much easier. And then what changes do you need to make to your weekly schedule to make sure that you get those things done? What are persistent time wasters? And we'll talk about that next. And was procrastination an issue? So we'll, we'll get to the pro procrastination and time wasters in a second. So next slide. <laughs> so forms of procrastination. I'm like the worst at this, you guys. I, uh, I, I have a diagnosis for ADD. And so, um, I'm like one of those people that just gets easily distracted and I can procrastinate, um, really well. <laughs> so I think these strategies can help. So ignoring the task and hoping it'll go away is a common one. Things don't just go away and magically get off your plate. So um, that's common. Another one is underestimating how long it'll take and overestimating your abilities and resources. So as we put things off, we think like, well, I'll get to it. I can do this. I'm great at multitasking. I'm, I'm great at working under pressure. But really what you're doing is you're under underestimating how long that task can take and that can really bite you later. Telling yourself that poor performance is okay and insisting on perfection. So telling yourself it's okay if I do an okay job on this thing because it's not really important. What we're really telling ourselves is that we don't have to put our all in something and really to get the job done. It, it, it always takes a lot of intention and being present in the moment. So make sure that you're, you're giving yourself a little grace and, you know, we can't always be perfect on the task, but we can always put our best foot forward and do our best at things. And then doing something else that isn't very important. I love the picture of this gal who's balancing the um, pencil on her nose. We sometimes we have to look at that that list that we made and what's the most thing uh, most important on our list and making sure that we're really sticking to that. If it isn't in line with what's really important, just don't do it. Stop yourself and don't do it. Sometimes I wear a rubber band on my wrist and I snap it on my wrist just to remind myself like, hey girl, get back to that task. Remember you opened another tab and you don't need to be diving into what this, you know, whatever I'm reading about. Um, so find ways to, to strategize, to remind yourself, bring you back to what's really important. And if you're not doing what's very important, don't do it. Um, believing that repeated minor delays won't hurt you. They add up little things over time add up. And a really good example of this, I, I have my three kiddos and a lot of the time I don't factor in their, their needs when I'm thinking about what I need to really get done during the day. And so, man, I can't even count how many times I had had an assignment due or um, a midterm or working in group projects for assignments for school and thinking like, oh, I have plenty of time for that. You know, I have all week to get this done. And then over time, I think about really how many little things are starting to add up, me going grocery shopping or my kiddo needing help with their homework or me needing to cook dinner or clean or go somewhere and do a task. Make sure that you're factoring those things in because they can't count against you talking about things rather than doing it. If you have time to talk about it and saying, I'll get to that, I'll get to that. Just get to it. Just do it. Shut, like block that time out and do it. Oftentimes when we are focused and we are in that mindset that we're wanting to get it done. That's the best time to do it. And then putting all your work only um, on only one part of the task. If it's a multi kind of level task where you you're going to need more time to focus on it uh, make sure that you really divvy up that that energy towards that task sometimes we can get zapped um, quicker than we realize and so um, really making sure that we we divide that time up and find that balance to make sure that the task gets done is really important and then becoming paralyzed paralyzed when having to make choices 
sometimes the best thing to do is just start one step and that'll start that momentum. Next slide. <laughs> All right, how to overcome procrastination. Win the mental battle by committing to being on time. You guys, this is really important. When there is a task that has a deadline, set your set a set a timer, set a schedule, block it out and make sure that you can remind yourself that being on time for that task is the most important thing. Keep those deadlines. Organize, schedule and plan. This is could be one of the most, if not the most important thing is to make sure that you have things set out and organized, put them in, on a calendar, write them down where you can visually see them and are reminded of them, schedule them out so you make sure you have time and plan to do them. Divide a big job into smaller ones. This one is great because a lot of the time it's hard to really look at a big task and think like, oh my gosh, it's just so, it's so much. It's just so much to do. I don't know if I can get this done. Just break it down. You know, if you have a um, an essay that you need to write and you know it's coming up and it's maybe a, a five page or maybe even a 13 page essay, however, however many pages, just think about maybe just starting the hook. Or even if you're not feeling uh, super creative, maybe just think about how to outline your research for it and what you're actually going to tackle for the topic. And then just break that down so that way you can kind of take one step at a time. Find a way to make a game of your work or make it fun. I was reading a, an article recently on Elon Musk and uh, how much he gets done. That dude is so productive. And one of the things they were saying uh, is the, the best strategy that he uses. And that's just that he loves what he does and he makes it enjoyable when he does it. So anytime you're doing something, there, there's a saying, fake it till you make it. It actually is true. Put a smile on your face, even if it hurts a little bit, and try and make the task fun for yourself. And that way it's a little bit easier to get it done. And then this one's really important. We don't do it enough. And that's just reward yourself when you're done. Our our, our minds um, are built off of that reward system. And so when we tell ourselves that we've done a good job and we acknowledge that, it's part of self-care. And we really need to to, to do that a lot more. We um, we do tasks all the time and we don't pat ourselves on the back. I can't count how many times I've done dishes. All I do it all the time and I don't say, man, you just killed it with the dishes, girl. Go, way, way to go. You know what? I'm just going to take five minute break and I'm just going to go and surf on the web and just do something that I enjoy. Okay. And then tell your friends and roommates to remind you of your priorities and deadlines. My kids remind me all the time. I uh, I ask them to be on my team and to help support me. And when I was in school, this is a big one. And uh, a lot of the time I just say, hey, you guys, I, I have this really big assignment due. Can you guys just remind me? Um, just just, just kind of give me a kick when I'm not on track. And, and they're really great about it. And I, I know a lot of um, people are on our teams uh, when we're a student and just in life in general. So include people on your team and then learn how to say no to time wasters. And so the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about time wasters. So learn to recognize when you're wasting time. The, the worksheet that you guys have available to you can really help with this and being able to see where those um, areas are that you're wasting time. And then decide what you need to do and what you can really realistically do. So another part of that breaking bigger tasks into smaller ones, this uh, can really help in and kind of realistically looking at what's feasible. It may not be feasible to write that 13 page essay if your kiddos are sick and you have a lot of other obligations, but if you can really kind of break that down, it can really help you conceptualize and open up your time a little bit more. Uh, this is a big one. Return texts and calls at your convenience. Oh my gosh, the phone is such a time killer. So please, please, please put your phone away when you have things to do and just learn how to say how to say no to people when they're asking for your time, when they're texting. Um, you can always get back to people. People are good about that. Wasting time is often linked to a lack of self-discipline. So a lot of the time, uh, being able to really know what you're able to do realistically and and having um, the conviction to follow through with that, it, it can really help boost that self-confidence and that self-esteem. And like just knowing I set those boundaries for myself and I did that and I accomplished them. So just learn how to kind of stay true to yourself in that. Ask yourself, do I really need to do this or not? That's important. 
you can say it out loud, even it sometimes it helps to just verbalize, do I really need to do this task right now? And is it, is it in my top five right now? If it's not, then it's okay to just say, you know what, I can walk away from this and then learn to say no when you don't have time. So we'll, we'll talk about that in the next slide a little bit. <laughs> All right. This one's hard for some of us. I grew up in a huge family and I, um, was always feeling bad and guilty about saying no to people, but I just need to say this out loud for anybody that needs to hear it. It is okay to say no. You can say no, okay? Avoid temptation to socialize when you've scheduled work. If somebody's making you feel bad that you're not hanging out, that's okay. They miss you. Take it as a, a compliment, but it's okay to tell them that you, you can't hang out, okay? text we just talked about our major distraction so just set boundaries for yourself this could be part of your reward system if you get a task done you can tell yourself you know what I'm gonna I, I can go and and return that person's text really quick and that's a way that I can reward myself is to really kind of dive into that and give myself that time for five to ten minutes to really respond to people if your friends are asking you to join last minute if anybody's asking you to join something last minute and you have to stop if it's not an emergency just just decline them, just straight up say, no, I can't do it. I appreciate you thinking about me, but let's get together later on when I have more time for you. And then that's another way you can reward yourself. I, I did all these things and I created this time so that I could get back to that person and hang out. Socializing is so important right now. You guys were, you know, especially last year, all the, all the um, social distancing that's happening right now and, and just shutdowns. It is important to socialize, but really, if you don't have time and you need to focus on things, it's okay to put it off for later. And then study somewhere where you will not be tempted to chat or watch movies or use social media. Social media is such a time waster. So please, please, please isolate yourself, create an environment that's really conducive to studying and make sure that you set that time aside for the things that you need to do later when you have freed up that time. Next slide, please. All right, so now we're gonna watch a video quickly on how to maximize some productivity. Yeah, it looks like there's an ad getting in the way. <laughs> there we go. So one, one of the things they were talking about, I think that was uh, the, the little ad was in the way is, is learn how, what is urgent and what is not urgent. So if something isn't really pulling your, you away from those important tasks and it's really not urgent, just don't do it, set it, set it aside and it's okay. And then I love in that video, it also reiterates that it's, it's okay to say no. It's actually really important to be able to do that. And it's smart. It's a strategy that you can use to be more effective with your time. So I want to talk about where we start. So, so now that we know a little bit of how to prevent some of that procrastination and how to, to eliminate time wasters and how to say no, I want to talk about the importance of setting goals. This is so important. This ties really ties in back to our the idea of 
what what we value, what's what's most important to us. And so when you break down that worksheet or you really think about your time and how you're utilizing that time, we want to think about what we want to get out of our time. And setting goals is such a beautiful way that we can see that really play out. So one of the things is make your goals specific and concrete. Don't be vague. So if you really want to get something done, it may be something really big. Like I want to graduate. I, I want to get a degree. I, I had to go through this a few years ago and think about really like, what do I want to get out of this? Don't be vague. Like I want to be successful in life. Okay. We all want to be successful in life, but what does that actually look like? Well, I want to get a degree and I want to graduate with my degree. And I want to be able to use that to get a career that I can really um, work in a field that I love. So set those goals specifically around the things that you find are most important. And then set both long-term and short-term goals to support those, okay? So and the, the, the reason this is really important kind of goes back into being able to break larger tasks down into smaller ones so that they're doable. So maybe your long-term goal is that you want to get a degree, you want to graduate and you want to get that degree. And maybe short-term ones more looks at like each term, e each semester that you're looking at. And, and maybe it even gets smaller than that and in each class or course, and then even smaller than that, each assignment. So maybe you think about, well, in order to get that, that degree and to really get to that long-term goal, I just need to write this paper. I just need to do this research. I need to complete this lab. Whatever it is that you're doing, kind of break it down. And then set a deadline for your goals. A lot of the time they say it takes around four to six years to graduate with a degree. I took six years to graduate. It's perfectly fine. We're all managing our, our lives around um, our degrees. So, you know, set, set a timeline of what that looks like. I had a complete graduation plan outlined and I worked with my advisors to do this. And then I really kind of set those goals within, in place of what I wanted to do. And so maybe... Um, some of those deadlines that you set may be that within that last year of your degree, you really want to get some work experience, or maybe you want to start um, looking into graduate programs, whatever it is, make sure that you really set that deadline for whatever that goal is. Integrate your goals. So when I say this school, personal, career, integrate them. And this goes into really um, understanding what our values are. So if we want to get um, get a degree and we want to graduate and that's one of our goals. Well, we want to do that because we want to have a career later. And one of the reasons why we want to have a career later is maybe because you want to better your situation. And that's a personal thing. Uh, for me, I set a goal that was integrated with getting my degree. And I wanted to do that because I want to work in a field that I really care about that I love. And I want to do that because I want to make enough money to buy a home and to get me and my children out of generational poverty. I really, really wanted to get off of government assistance and be able to provide for my kids and set the tone for them to where they can do amazing things in their life. So really try and integrate a lot of those goals into what you want long-term and make it personal. It's what motivates us. It's what gives us passion to follow through. And then realize that goals change and, and that you can stick to those things that change as long as the goal is still set. So maybe you maybe you wanted to major in, in public health and at, you know, maybe the first year that you were in your, your um, program, you just realized, you know what, I actually really want to go to school to be a teacher instead. I really want to teach people about health. And uh, so maybe those goals change, but over time, it really, you know, you're still sticking to the goal overall, but you're just kind of moderating it a little bit. So just make sure that, you know, you can shift in and out of what you need to do. Just make sure that you stick to it. Next slide, please. All right. And then from goals, we're going to set our priorities. This is already something that you'll do day to day, but over time, you're going to get better at it and you're going to look at bigger, uh, bigger picture, what those priorities look like. Okay. So what's important and what isn't important. It may seem like at first it's a sim simple, you know, like the, you know, the, the things that I find are important should just stand right out, but that's not necessarily true. It takes a little bit of introspection to really think about what those things that are important to us are. And those things can change depending on our situation. I, I know people who um, are, are just having their first children and what seemed like was important to them has changed vastly from before. Or maybe we've uh, had, especially this last year, we've had loved ones that have gotten sick 
Uh, and we've had to really rearrange what's really important to us to prioritize. So think about what that is and what sets well with you. And then um, just really put that on the top of your list. And what order do things need to be done in? We talked about those five top five things. It's okay to bump things up or bump things down on your list. Um, just you know, really sit with that and make sure that those are really the most important things to you. And then once you know what your priorities are, you need to plan out a schedule for that goal. And I put for the semester because we're we're talking about school here. This is such a useful tool, and uh, you'll see it uh, here throughout this the presentation how we do this. But really setting planning out a schedule. What you're doing is that you're recognizing within yourself that you're using that mind management. You're saying, I trust myself to be able to know what's important to me. And that's it. that's good. It's a part of self-care to know yourself. And you're saying, you know what, now I'm gonna put that outside of myself and I'm gonna schedule this. I'm gonna make it tangible so that way I can get it done, okay? And utilize this without throughout your weeks or even fine tune it throughout your day. Acknowledge the realities that college is hard and keeping a schedule can be difficult and that it takes a lot of time and effort. And then planning may seem really hard at first, but the more you do it, really, it just it's just like any other muscle that you flex, it gets easier and more natural at doing it. Next slide, please. All right, so we're gonna talk about, this is one of my favorite things of just revisiting your values. Again, it seems very simple, and but maybe we don't do it enough. Know what is the most valuable to you and what gives you direction in your life. I cannot tell you how important this is. It, it seems like maybe just making the schedule and planning out your goals, it, that's, that's the most important thing. But tying it into what our co core values are is what's going to give us the motivation to follow through. And this is important, you guys, because it's your goal. It's not my goal that you're setting for you. It's your goal. So attaching it to what you feel is the most valuable and gives you the most direction in your life is really what's going to help you out. So finding a major or finding, um, you know, an area of, of study that really resonates with you is probably what's going to give you the most value and the most bang for your buck later on to where you're happy. So just make sure that whatever goal that you're setting, it's really in line. It's aligned with what you're wanting to do. And then your energy really should be oriented first towards the things that reflect those values that are most important to you. So if you're putting energy into things that really are not that important to you, you are wasting time. So we're going back to prioritizing and we're thinking about those things that are on the top of your list. And if you're finding that your energy is not going towards those things, really Go back and think about how much you value the things that you're putting your energy towards and are they that important? And then just examine your values to help you make those time management decisions. Next slide, please. All right, now we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of how we're going to actually make the schedules. Set up your semester calendar. This is so important. Each of your classes and when you talk to your professors or, or your advisors, they'll tell you kind of a little bit what your semester is going to look like. And so if it's something where you have some really hard prereqs coming up, like me, for me, I'm a, a psychology major and behavioral science, and uh, I get people, but I don't necessarily get math and language. And so some of those classes that were a lot harder for me, I, I had to make sure that I blocked out time and that I knew what those things were coming up that were really going to pull away my attention and focus. And I had to make sure that I had a game plan going for those. So block all the important dates in your semester um, for that, for that, or that, that trimester, whatever you're in, um, calendar system you're in, make sure you set those important dates. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about how to utilize calendars, but really make sure that you set those up. And then set your time obligations. We looked in the video a little bit of what that looked like for the, the RAC method, but you're, you'll start to see when you set those time obligations where your, your open times are that you have a little bit more freedom and you're gonna see how much time you're gonna have in those obligations that it's going to take away from the other areas of your life. So it's really important to block that time out. Block out all class and lab times. This is so important because you don't wanna miss 
you don't want to miss an opportunity to learn. You're paying for your education. You're taking your time to, to complete your degree. Make sure you don't miss class and don't miss your labs. Look at your syllabus for your class schedule. This one's really good. And I had to utilize this all the time. See how heavy your grade is for each activity. Sometimes I, I just found myself, um, I have three asthmatic children. So when they get sick, they really get sick and it can really just zap my focus. And I go straight into mom mode and I hulk out and I just go in full nurture mode and I completely forget everything else. So if there's something that needs to get done, that's really valuable in terms of your, your, your grade, get those things done first. Don't get the little things done that don't count. Really like understand how heavy the weight of each of your activities are for your classes and prioritize those things. So you get the bigger heavy hitters out of the way so that way you get a better grade. Okay, and then highlight all your exams and project due dates. This one's important too, because I mean, some professors are flexible but some really are not. And if you miss a due date and you ask later, hey, can I get some extension on this? A lot of the time you missed it. You just missed it. And that's so much of your grade that can drop down just, just by not putting it on your calendar, okay? And then work backwards from your exams and papers. So if you know what the expectations are, kind of start breaking it down and working back. So that way you can get some of the bigger things out of the way. Like I said, take that stress level down. Okay, and then and then th that way the like later things that you have less time for don't count as much and they're smaller. Okay, and then block out your study time. This is really a big one too because we may think that we have more time than we actually do. And when you actually block your study time out, you're you're optimizing your focus more, and you're taking that time to really be more successful. And then allot yourself time for your sanity and self care. I, a lot of the time block time out at the end of the day where I could just take a hot shower and just decompress. So just make sure that you're taking care of yourself. Again, if you're always stressed out, you're not tapping into that logical part of your brain. You really are not. And so you just have to take some time to just chill out. Next slide, please. All right. And then here we go, guys, make to-do lists. I just want to say thank you for all of you guys for, for hanging in there right now with me. Um, so to-do lists are like my best friend. I make them every day and I'll show you some examples, but talking about the importance of this, don't make a to-do list on your steering wheel like this gal did in the picture. It's not realistic and not safe. List all your things out that you need to do for the day. I uh, like to write them on a piece of paper, but there are other strategies. There's Microsoft To Do, um, and it's a free app that you can use. Um, I set reminders on my Echo Dot. A friend of mine got me for Christmas, and, and sometimes that helps me remind myself things I need to do. Be realistic about what you write on your list. Like, again, we're revisiting what's important and then using... Um, a little bit of our, just our, our own self-knowledge of what we know, what we can and can't do. And then be sure to include tangible tasks. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to see on some of the examples that I give, some of the tangible tasks that I've used, um, but write things down that you can get done. Find a coding system that works for you. I kind of star things. If you have a highlighter, highlight things, whatever coding system that you use to um, to make sure that you can visually cue yourself of what's important. If it's just order, put it on the top of your list or highlight, whatever it is. Use something that works for you and it helps. And take a deep breath and enjoy crossing things off. This is like the best feeling. I don't know if you guys watch those like oddly satisfying videos out there, but man, it is oddly satisfying being able to cross something off your list. It, it actually brings your stress level down significantly when you can just take a deep breath and just know that something is, is done. And then give yourself some grace. It's okay if everything doesn't get done. This goes a little bit more into self-care and being realistic. You're not going to get everything done on your to-do list and that is okay, but you're getting things done and make sure that you're reminding yourself that you're doing it and you're awesome for doing it. And then I just again, use technology. It is your friend. We're already on our phone so much. Set phone reminders of getting things done and use those things around you to help break down that to-do list. Next slide, please. 
All right, so here's some examples. And these are actually my, my to-do lists. You guys, everybody's to-do lists look different, but they're, they're really funny. So on the left-hand side, I had one from, from back in February and this was winter term. Man, my kids were sick during this time. It was a bummer and I had a lot going on. And you can see, I broke it down into different actual classes. And so for one of my classes, I had to write an entire manuscript on, um, uh, on a research topic that I had to do. And I wrote each little thing out. I wanted to have a method section. I wanted to be able to have my abstract done, my discussion, all these things, and then the formatting even. And I put it on my to-do list to make sure that I wasn't forgetting about these things. All the things didn't get done on this to-do list, but I wanted to really put them out there so that I can see them visually of what needs to get done. And then I even continued it onto another page because it didn't even fit on one page. And I broke down. And if you look at almost on the middle of that second page on to-do where it says continued, it says drink tea. That I put that is very tangible. I I drink water and tea all the time, but I needed to remind myself to take care of myself. So put things on there that you can do. I checked my bank account and I and I paid my bills. I had to pay my bills. So I mean, I I didn't check it off on this to do list, but trust me, I did pay my bills. But it feels good to just check that off. And these are personal things that I did in my personal life as well as in my academic life where I just really need to get it done. And I wanted to wink it. I completed the Jeanette Rankin scholarship essays because I did get awarded. So make sure you block out time for things that are important to you, like getting strategies that'll help you in school, like getting scholarships. And I also put like, check my email. On the middle one, you can see, I made it a little more visual for myself. This is a really hard, hard semester that I was in and I just really, I, need, I needed something to visually cue myself. At the time I was a, a mentor um, for the TRIO program and I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't forgetting any of, my, any of my mentees to check in with them. I even put buy deodorant on there. I know that sounds ridiculous, but I was sweating that term, you guys. So I, I even wrote that down so I would not forget it. Write anything down that you need to write down on your to-do list. It's, it's you, this is tied into who you are and what you need to get done. So make it personal and check those things off. It, it feels amazing. And then I even wrote on there, and I don't know if you guys can see that above my weird, um, on my, uh, just below my mountain scene, I wrote, have a great weekend. Because I just want to remind myself that these are things that I'm doing that are really important, and they're not easy things to do. And it's, you know, just remind yourself, these are hard things, and that, you know, just chill out and have a good weekend. <laughs> All right, next slide, please. bearing a bit of my soul. So we're going to talk a little bit about calendars and how important calendars are. So we can go into the next slide because I want to want to show you guys while I'm talking. So keeping a, a daily or weekly monthly calendar for me was a game changer. And the first year of my undergrad when I was at community college, I, I don't know how I did it, but I kept everything up top. And I, I think I didn't have as much on my plate yet because I wasn't strategizing and taking up uh, taking opportunities um, when they came. I was passing down tons of opportunities that I could have had to really optimize that experience in my undergrad. And so a friend of mine said, Kat, how are you, how do you remember all these things? And I was like, I don't, I forget things all the time. And I've, I've, I've missed so many meetings. I've missed so many things um, that I, I mean, it was sad how many things I missed. Um, I mean, class times even, I was missing class times, just completely spacing, and, or how much time it took to walk from my car to campus, things like that. And so what I started to do is I started to keep a calendar. Luckily, this friend was really great at keeping calendars. And so we were able to, to see that calendar and, and in front of me and schedule out time. So next, next slide, and you'll be able to see my, my daily calendar here and how it looks, and it was really jam-packed. And then here's a weekly calendar a different couple months that I'll show you. And so I color block things because it makes me, uh, it, it cues me visually. So for certain classes, I'd use green. So any of my like cultural planning classes, or maybe it was like psychology, I would make sure that I blocked out in certain colors, things that were really important that I just really did not want to miss. I blocked out in red, kind of like danger, 
you know, it just reminded me of those things, things that I had that were optional, I'd color code a, a different way. So really use, like I said, those, those cues and those coding systems to help you. And I blocked out things in my schedule that had to do with my children. I blocked out things like labs. I blo blocked out um, office hours. It didn't mean that I had to go to all those things. I just wanted to make sure that I had them visually on cue. So that way, every day when I opened up my schedule, I would go and I'd check my schedule and I'd make sure even the night before I check my schedule and say, what's going on tomorrow? What's going on today? And what do I need to get done? And it would just help, help me not miss out on opportunities. Next slide, please. So on some of these uh, next ones, you can see, um, I don't know if it's kind of hard fine print, but on one of those days, I had 10 or more obligations and they were on my to-do list. So if the if this calendar was side by side with one of those to-do lists, you could see exactly what that looked like that corresponded with my actual schedule that I made and then my to-do list. And I just made sure that I was breaking all of those things down and staying organized, having a plan, and they all were in line with what my goals were. Next slide, please. All right, guys. So hopefully a lot of these things are helpful. So really just staying on top of things is so Im important. Just, you know, make sure that you're revising what's what's on your plate and, and make sure that you're looking to see if it needs to be there. Make sure that you put all changes. I know most syllable, uh, syllabus, syllabi, most professors will put in their syllabus that things can change and that, that just to keep an eye on, on uh, the schedule. So make sure that if anything changes, a, an exam or papers do, make sure you reschedule it. Um, any kind of meetings that you need to do or like cancellations, just make sure that you revise those too. Work schedules change a lot, people coming to visit or just things that are on your plate. Just make sure that you revise those things and then adjust them. And then just make sure that you're looking at things day to day. So sometimes, you know, you put the effort in to make all these changes and to build a schedule or to-do list. But if you're not looking at them and reminding yourself that they're happening, or like we said, wishing they'll go away, <laughs> it's not going to get done. So make sure that you preview each day to see what's going on. And then sometimes just getting a game plan of what could change. There is a strategy to put yourself under a fake amount of pressure before an exam. And sometimes this can help you in, in really optimizing your performance for that exam, but this can go for anything. So if you fake yourself out and go through a mock, kind of a fake, a fake um, trial, let's say for whatever that task is, sometimes that can help you adjust your behavior or your strategy to where you're more efficient. Next slide, please. All right, this one's really important. It's one of the last things we're gonna talk about and that's time blocking. And so we have something called creative and logical parts of our brain that we can use to get things done. So please, 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 if you have things that require a lot of creativity and you are not feeling creative, don't force yourself. You can't, you can't. There's just no way that you can do it. So if you need to be innovative and creative and you have to come up with a new idea or something, or like um, maybe you have to come up with an essay of your choice. It's a topic of your choice. And you're just not really feeling very creative at the moment and you have writer's block. Do not force yourself to do it. Do something logical. Maybe just get that math math homework done, or maybe just break down some of the simple things like, okay, how am I going to actually organize this? Instead of being creative, think about how you're going to schedule it out and deal with something that is not creative. So make sure that when you time block any of your tasks, if you are not in that mindset to do one or the either, whether, you know, if you're, you're having to really think about, you know, um, you know, calculating the, the slope of something, or you're having to do algebra and you're just not in your logical brain and you're just feeling more creative and artistic, try and express that energy in some task in some way so that you're utilizing that part of your brain and that part of yourself and really optimizing that time. Next slide, please. All right, we're reviewing you guys. Your time and energy management can make you more productive and reduce your stress level it is so true. Set 
goals, make a schedule, revisit and revise your plan. Those three steps really can help you just be so successful in your time management. Be tough with your time. You can be tough with your time. It's okay to avoid procrastination and time wasters and learn how to say no to distractions. It's so important. Employ a variety of time management strategies to maximize your time. We learned about how to set goals and how to use schedules and how to use to-do lists to do that. So make sure that you're implementing those strategies. And then you guys relax and enjoy the time that you just freed up by doing all of this. It's really important to reward yourself. You guys are amazing and you're doing amazing things every day. You are doing amazing things. And even if they seem mediocre at the time, I pat yourself on the back for going grocery shopping. If you've just made a Costco trip or a trip to, you know, the canned food warehouse or wherever you're going, get home and take just a few moments to just decompress and just give yourself a pat on the back for doing that. It's really a big deal what you're all doing right now. So please, please, please make sure that you relax and you reward yourself. All right, next slide. And I think we are open for Q&A. So if anybody has any questions, but enjoy your time as a student. It's, it's awesome. It's great learning new things. All right, so I am just gonna open it up to any questions or discussion if anybody has any thoughts. And yeah, pat yourself on the back for getting through this, 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 this whole workshop. <laughs> you're here for a reason because you're committing to bettering yourself. So way to go. All right. Are there any Hi. questions? Um, my name is Rosemary. And I just wanted to say, yeah, it was a really great presentation. I enjoyed it and a lot of helpful in. And I just wanted to add that I think that um, a lot of women um, should also try not to feel guilty if they can't get to everything in the same time or in the, in one day, um, because the expectation is so great, as you were saying, Kat, in the presentation, that I think it's important if you don't get to everything today, not to feel guilty. Um, and, you know, I, I just want to just put that out there. I think that's important. Oh, thank you, Rosemary. I cannot agree with you more. I yeah. I grew up in a huge house. I'm the youngest of nine children. I have five older sisters, and my mama was great at being uh, using guilt as a as a way to really kind of shame herself for not doing enough. And but when you really look at the bigger picture, she was doing so many things. She had nine children. I think that's a really good point that you make. Is that a lot of um, a lot of women, but a lot of individuals in general, they just don't give themselves enough um, grace to really just realize that they're doing a lot. It takes a lot to do day-to-day -day life in general, but especially going back to school. So I, I totally agree with you. Yeah, it's not, also it's not helpful to shame ourselves for not getting everything done. You know, it's not gonna get the job done. Right. So thank you so much for reminding us of that. It really is important. Hello, my name is Shira. <laughs> And I wanted to thank you for this valuable information, but I also wanted to include that when you have everything all outlined from your calendar to your schedule, uh, sometimes life does get in the way. In my particular case, it's a chronic illness. Um, like I have sickle cell anemia and I have to make sure that I'm hydrated as well so I have to add like a mental component um, to my time management as well, because I have to have that cushion time just in case I get a crisis and I can't complete my essay or I can't complete an assignment. But the most valuable thing you said, Kat, was to communicate with my professors um, and my instructors, because if I let them know ahead of time, um, they do allow that lead way. So communication, is also uh, very important in my time management due to my chronic illness. And again, uh, thank you all for this forum and this information was very, very valuable. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Shira, for reminding me to, to really emphasize that it, the importance and you're absolutely right and good, good on you for, for utilizing those strategies to take care of your body. We are using this vessel to get the things done. If we're not well, we're probably not gonna get a whole lot done. And that's such a good point that you make is that being able to really block out time to, to take, you know, to, for self-care and that means physical self-care. I mean, hydrating yourself, 
proper nutrition, plenty of sleep, those are game changers in really being able to optimize time management. If you're feeling lousy and you're not taking care of your physical body, you're probably not going to be able to focus much. And you're just going to have to take more time to kind of catch back up physically to get to the point where you feel okay to, to do those tasks. And um, another really great point that you pointed out is, is communicate that if you're needing help, a lot we all are human and a lot of our professors really appreciate that communication and being able to help us be more successful. They're not mind readers and they don't know what our situations are. And a lot of the time they, they wanna know those things so that way they can be helpful. And, and I know we, we talk about this in one of our other workshops that we just had recently on um, College 101 and going back to college and that's utilizing resources like your um, disability center or, or accessibility education center uh, to be able to get accommodations for some of those disabilities that you may have that may um, create barriers in being more successful. And so if, if you have accommodations for things that you need, like a disability, or maybe it's just, um, you know, a, a, a learning disability or physical disability, being able to have extra time um, from your professors to be able to take tests and do the things that you need to be more successful in your classes, that takes, um, it takes an awareness and it takes communication outside of you to be able to make those things happen. So such a great point, Shira. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here and sharing that. Anybody else have any ideas? This is so cool. I love this stuff. I, I wish I would have had this right out the gate when I started school. A lot of this is trial and error. I know, I was gonna say that. <laughs> You're right yep. on point with that. Because when I was actually sick, um, I'm usually out for like four months. So I was uh, attending and I'm still attending California Baptist University. So this format that you have provided is like, okay, where were you Kat? Where were you like, four, you know, a, a few months ago when I started school? Because a, a quick little testimony, when I was sick, they, I was placed on, um, what do you call it? probation, academic probation, because I couldn't finish my courses because I was in the hospital. And then I came back and I tried to organize myself and utilize some of the very same things that you did with time management, but you have it in such detail that you should bottle this up and sell it because it's great. So I went from academic probation to a D to a C to all A's and I was on the Provo list. So this stuff, this formula, this content, it works. And thank you so much. Awesome. Congratulations for pulling yourself up. That is so cool. I love it. And I'm seeing a lot in the chat right now, self-motivation, uh, Valencia. Yes, absolutely. Self-motivation is so important. I can't even tell it tell you how many times I thought like, you know what, that's, it's something that's important to me. So it doesn't matter as much because I'm not taking care of everybody else around me. And, uh, and I deprioritized what was important to me thinking that that wasn't worth my time. And really what it, it's doing is it's telling yourself that you're not important. The things that you, you need are not important. And that's not true. Uh, there's an old saying that I've heard many times when mama's okay everybody's okay when mama's not okay nobody's okay and so i learned how to really kind of implement that idea of um there's also another saying you have to put your life vest on first before you help anybody else so when you find out what's really most important to you and you you really implement um strategies that are aligned with those things you will have the motivation to get them done and a lot of the time the people around you will jump in line and they'll they'll follow suit and they'll help you they'll help support you in that so i love that i love that that you're you're you guys are are winking at that a little bit more because it's so important this is the coolest you guys <laughs> that's so neat <laughs> my name is rosemary again oh go ahead carol i hope you can hear me well i'm driving <laughs> we can hear you yeah. be careful Safe, drive safe. Oh, I, I am. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring out is sometimes we have setbacks, but it doesn't mean the end of everything. Uh, there was a humiliating setback that I had myself. Um, you were talking about the time management. I remember getting 15 credit hours 
but I thought that that would be best for me. Found out nine is my limit. But um, with that said, um, I was told to do an essay. And I think that we were talking about um, setting those times when you may have writer's block. I didn't realize it at the time, but I did have writer's block. And why it was a humiliating experience for me, because when I was younger, I was actually a junior writer for Ebony Jet Magazine. And oh. so when they told me my writing sucked, pretty much, <laughs> in layman's term, it was, oh, yeah, God. I felt devastated. And so I wanted to withdraw from my classes because most of uh, my major is writing. And so um, I thought, oh, what am I going to do? And um, the first thing you should do is just take stock in um, what has been going on around you, what could be your block at that moment. Uh, once you get that in order, the next thing I did, because I wasn't accepted to that school, I recognized there's other institutions. And so I reapplied and I was just accepted. Oh. That is so, I love, I love that you just shared that story. This is such a great example, Carol, of like pushing yourself when you really don't need to put that pressure on yourself. If you, if you have writer's block, I'm sure there are probably other ways that you could have utilized your time than forcing yourself to write this kind of maybe mediocre uh, pro end product, you know, an end result. Cause my, boy, when you force yourself to do something that you're really, you're just not into it, usually it, 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 it reads outside of what you're doing. So being able to, to kind of get into that space that um, where you're feeling, first of all, motivated to be able to do that task, it's really in line with the, the kind of type of feeling that you're having, whether it's creative or logical, and then following through is a, is a game changer in the end result. And then I love also, Carol, that you talked a little bit about how, um, you know, you got criticism on that and it really affected you in the way that you move forward. That's a great example of recalibrating and really revisiting that you had a goal. You're, you, you love writing. It's, it's aligned with who you are and, and your values, but that particular criticism could have really affected you in a negative way to really stop you from accomplishing your goals. And it could have shut you down, but instead you went ahead and you just looked at other strategies to really revise that plan. And this is another great um, plug for our workshop on how to, how to pick a college that we just had in that sometimes maybe it's just the program isn't the right fit for you. And you went and you found another program and that's Seriously, that's amazing. I love that. So good, good on you and, and good point. You know, sometimes we just kind of need a reset and it's okay to take that time. Um, I saw in the chat really quick um, that a problem is asking for help and especially with kids, that, um, this person's kids. And a lot of times uh, when they need it, they can't ask. And then fear of people telling you no when you really need help. And I cannot tell you how much I resonate with this. Uh, even though I'm the youngest of nine kids does not mean that I came from a functional background. And I have a lot of siblings that I oftentimes help. So when I have to ask for help, I have had a long, long, um, running fear of being rejected when I've asked for help. And so when I started my, my undergrad, I remember going back to school and actually getting my GED. And when I went back to school, I asked my three young children, they were really young back then. Um, I, I told them that we're, there was going to be a big change. And instead of just telling them, you know, Hey, I'm going to school and this is my thing. What I did, and I don't know if this helps at all is that I included them on it. They are part of my life and they're, they're like arguably the most important part of my life aside from myself. And I have to let them know, Hey, this is a journey that we're all going on and I'm going to really need your support. And just like I support them in the incredible things that they're interested in and that nurture who they are, I, I was asking the same of them and I wasn't expecting it. And so what happens is, is that the people around you that you're including in that experience, I don't, maybe just a, a different way of shifting that you're asking for help is more that you're including them. You're offering somebody the opportunity to support you in something bigger than yourself. 
You're going for something that's going to improve upon your situation in your life. And that's a big deal. So maybe, you know, when you're asking for help, it's maybe strategizing how you're, how you're using your language. And that may help you in feeling like, instead of feeling like a rejection of like that somebody's telling you no, it just may be that they're also doing what you're doing they're, they're kind of drawing up boundaries around their life and they're realizing, Hey, maybe I, I can't do this right now, but it doesn't mean that they're not wanting to support me right now. So, and then there are lots of areas of, of support. So when you, um, start school, th there are departments that are dedicated just to supporting students. And then there are clubs on campus of other students that are dedicated to just to supporting and nurturing interests and being able to offer that support. So if there's ever um, a time to really start relying on that ability to ask outside of yourself for help, and I know how hard that is, and feeling that rejection, start digging into other resources. So that way you kind of put all the feelers out and you're bound to get help somewhere. And then I'm trying to keep up with the chat because this is such good discussion right now. Um, let's see. We will have more uh, sessions available just really quickly to plug that. We have another um, workshop coming up uh, called uh, How to Pay for College. And so it's all about financial stuff and it's going to be great. And that's coming up this, this coming Wednesday. And so I encourage all of you to attend that on the 17th, same time, one o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time, and then four o'clock um, Eastern Time. And please, please, please make sure that you keep an eye out on our website, where we will have all of these um, workshops available, uh, recordings available for you guys to watch them later. So if you missed anything, or I mean, you're like me, where you really need to take a lot of time to soak up, I just I've been talking this whole time and I've given you guys a lot of information. Um, go back and pause it. Find, find, um, you know, find time to like, we're talking about time management, find time that you guys can watch these. Okay. And then um, I will share the PowerPoint as well. I believe we'll have um, a PDF available so, so, so that the slides will be available uh, for you. And then let's see. Um, I am seeing, wondering if you're aware of added pressures with school or life in general due to the pandemic and how we can work around this uncertainty. This is so good. Rosemary, thank you. Um, yes, absolutely. A lot of the, um, a lot of the policies that have changed around COVID and um, just, you know, p interactions in general, they're, everything's changed. Obviously we can, there's a lot to unpack there, but I would say, um, as far as like uncertainties, this is a good way, uh, to utilize the what ifs. So like, I'm a, I'm a plan B plan, plan C kind of, kind of gal. Um, I worry a bit sometimes. And so when I would write out my schedule, here's a real good example during COVID, um, and a way that I utilize this strategy so when COVID hit, I was in my final year of my undergrad. It was just go, go, go time. I was in, a, I was doing a lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot. Um, I was in multiple research labs as a, a research assistant and prepping for grad school applications. I also was working three jobs and all three of my kids were pulled out of school and I was taking a full-time course load and it was insane. It was just insane. I can't, I, there's no other way to say it and just a lot of juggling. And I remember thinking to myself, how is it that I'm going to be an educator overnight, essentially, to three different age levels? At the time, my daughter was eight, I had an 11 year old, and a 13 uh, year old. And I thought, how, how am I how going to teach, how will I teach them <laughs> and take care of myself and take care of my academic life? And so what I what I did is I actually made um, a completely different schedule that was a what if schedule. And I know this maybe sounds a little silly, but it was what if my kids get sick during the next week? And it was based around this idea of, um, because everything was uncertain, we didn't know what really COVID was going to do. And with my kids being asthmatic, I was really kind of in this fear-based reactive mode. And I thought, what if my kids get sick, like really sick? And I have to stop what I'm doing to take care of them. And I started strategizing ways that I could tackle my coursework ahead of time. I communicated with my professors ahead of time and let them know, look, I, you know, 
I, I have, I have three kiddos that I have to help with their homework. I also want to make sure that I'm successful in this course. And what can I do to really do that? And so, um, communication is really, I would, one of the things that I would just suggest the most right now is that if you're dealing with pressures from school and there's pressures in your life and you're wanting to make sure that you are optimizing your time so that you're not under so much pressure, talk to people and get help. Find resources that will break some of those things down. And then again, like what's realistic? Sometimes, I mean, I, I had to take a hit on one of my classes. I got, I know it sounds uh, silly, but I got a C and that C maybe doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but a lot of my scholarships and grants were writing on me keeping a certain GPA. And, and if I went below that GPA, I lost that funding. And if I lost that funding, that means I had to come up with some other strategy on how to pay for my housing and utilities. I mean, everything's very a delicate balance um, when you're low income and you're a single mom. So uh, really like utilizing the strategies that I had to be successful and to talk to my professors, see what counted the most, see if I could get extensions on the assignments that I couldn't do and making a plan B uh, calendar sometimes can help. The Downside to that, though, is that if you're taking more time worrying about something that hasn't happened, you may need to revisit what's really important. And if you're worrying too much, try not to worry too much. Find resources resources that can help and support. Is there anything else? <laughs> I love this. This is the coolest discussion ever. <laughs> this is so neat. I love all the... Um, personal experiences that people have too. This is so valuable to hear from each other and help each other out because, uh, man, during my undergrad, I remember just feeling very alone and not knowing where to go for things um, and how to, how to find that support. So if that's something that any of you are struggling with, trust me, there are other people out there that are having trouble with, with managing their time and being successful in their coursework and their programs. So if you're just starting out, or even if you have you know, time under your belt in school, trust me, there are things that you can do to be successful. And we're just gonna hang out and if there are any other thoughts or ideas, let us know. How did I determine my career goals? Did you know ahead of time? This is a great question, so good, no. I did not know. Um, I determined my career goals probably in almost almost the home stretch of my undergrad. So when I first first started, my goal was to get my GED. I I never went to high school or middle school, and so uh, I just wanted to get my GED. So that way I could get better temp jobs. Honestly, I know that um, you know maybe some of you can resonate with that, but I I just want to get my GED. Once I started getting my GED, and then I I decided, you know what, I want, I definitely want to get my GD because I want to go to community college and I just wanted to get my associate's degree. And once I got plugged into that track, I realized, man, I really like school. And I, I think I actually want to go for a bachelor's degree. I still didn't have a major declared at all. And then, um, honestly, what, what determined my major was that I had so many credits in that area. I really love people. And I took, psychology at my community college and they only offer psychology courses up to 200 level so I took all the psychology courses that were um, available to me at community college because I just loved them I thought they were awesome I thought I was going to go for an art degree just because I just do not love math but what really happened um, over time is that I developed an understanding of what I I'm gr great at and things that I like and I nurtured those things so I didn't know ahead of time. I figured them out as I went along. And um, these are all things that we also talk about in our workshop on how to pick a college and College 101. So if that's something that you, you want to hear a little bit more about, I encourage you to watch those workshops. But I would also just say, um, determining your career goals, that kind of goes back. This is a very personal thing, and it may be different for each person. My own personal um, suggestion would, would be, do do something that you love. I mean, you know, if you can imagine doing things for the the last, you know, 
like, you know, 20 to 40, 60 years of your life, however old you, old you are and however long you live, then uh, it's going to be a long road if you're doing something you don't like. So do something that you like. And I just want to remind everybody that um, if you have not yet, and, and I encourage you to please read over our eligibility requirements for our scholar grant, Jeanette Ringa Foundation provides scholar grants to women over the age of 35 in the US. And if you live in Georgia, women over 25, if you're living in Georgia. So if you're living outside of Georgia and you're over 35, please, 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 I encourage you, go apply for our grant. Um, you know, th these are things that we're always trying to find ways to manage our time. For me, one of the best ways that I manage my time was finding funding to be able to pay for school. So that way I wasn't worried about my housing. I mean, once I, once I had my basic needs taken care of, trust me, you can, you can focus on a lot more outside of that and being creative in your life. So please, uh, if you have not read over our eligibility requir requirements, go read over our eligibility requirements. Um, they'll put a, a link here in the chat. Latrina just added. And then see if you're eligible. And if you are, go apply for our scholar grant. We love supporting uh, students um, in, in being able to pursue an education. I'm one of them. So there's no, you know, nothing better than being able to give yourself that pat on the back when you've graduated and being able to see yourself um, accomplish those goals. So. Yeah, go apply. <laughs> and Karen is saying in the chat, and I just want to remind all of you that our scholar grants are non-tuition based grants. So what that means is they don't go um, to your institution. They get paid directly to you. We are a unique foundation in that we offer uh, money to our scholars who are awarded our scholar grant so that way you can pay what you want to pay with it. Um, I I had a full ride scholarship from my university um, and I needed housing. I needed money for housing. It's really expensive to live where I am. And when I got the Jeanette Rankin Foundation scholar grant, um, when I was in my, my undergrad, I got to put it towards my housing costs. I just paid my my landlord directly from those funds and it was amazing so if you're finding yourself in a situation where maybe you need a you know you need to fix your car to get to school and you can't get funding for that and you're in your you know you're in your program please 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 apply for our scholar grant because if you are awarded it's such a game changer to be able to get that support <laughs> And if there's anything that you guys need um, answered for as far as time management, I am here for for a bit longer. I love I love the camaraderie within the chat too going on um, of how much you all relate to each other. So, and again, you guys block out time to apply for the scholar grants. A lot of the time, winter uh, term or winter semester is when you would apply for those uh, grants. So block out that time to make, uh, you know, to write your essays or to fill out your applications. It takes a little bit of time. So cool thing about our scholar grant platform when you apply is that you can save your progress. So, but please, please, please block out time and also give yourself time to um, request your recommenders to write you a letter of recommendation if you are going to apply. I'm seeing all the love in the chat right now. This is so cool. <laughs> um, a question was, did you reach out to find mentors? This is such a good question. I love this. Uh, no, I did not. <laughs> I wish I would have known. I wish I would have known what I know now. Uh, I did, however, uh, find a uh, a student organization on campus. It's called the Non-Traditional Student Union. And they have a non-traditional student program at the University of Oregon where I went to school. Um, and so there were a lot of supports in that. Um, I found people that could relate to me. I did join a mentoring program during my undergrad for women in STEM. Um, and it was helpful to a degree, but a lot of the mentors that were in that program were, were younger than me. And they didn't have children and they didn't have um, prior career experience. And um, 
amazing individuals and brilliant, brilliant, um, brilliant students, but could not relate to a lot of my challenges that I had in my life and barriers that I had to getting my degree. So um, I didn't find a mentor until um, later, you know, my last year of my undergrad. And uh, you really just have to make those connections. I, I suggest going out and, you know, if you're not finding um, the right fit for somebody who you really just want to model yourself after and ask important questions, go out and keep looking. You know, some programs aren't aren't always offering the things that you need. So, uh, but such a great suggestion is um, mentors are incredibly helpful in being able to help you even just managing time and things. Oh, and then there's a question is, do our recommendations have to be from instructors or professors? And no, they do not. Although it is really, really important um, to, to have that if you can, it is not it's not a, a do or die kind of thing. In fact, we we love seeing recommendations just from people who know you. It cannot be from somebody um, like a family member or friend. We want to see it from people like in your community. It could be somebody if if you're religious. It could be somebody from your church. Um, maybe somebody in your community. Somebody who um, somebody that you volunteered with maybe and seen you seen you work or maybe um, an employer. It could be an employer as well. So. Yeah, your recommendations could be from other people within your community and your lives. And there's also an FAQ, um, everyone on our website, that um, can answer some of these questions as well. And you're also welcome to reach out to us um, and email us, uh, you know, questions if you have those as well. And then I also see, yeah, the steep housing costs. I get it. And uh, yeah, it's it's rough. So I always say yes, non non-traditional students, uh, adult learners, or however you want to identify as got to stick together. There's a lot of life experience that we all have to to lend, you know, to to supporting each other. So I encourage you, uh, if you're in a, a program right now at school, make those connections with people around you. And even if they're not non-traditional students, make connections with younger students too, because they often have a lot of useful information. These are all things we also talk about in our College 101 workshop. <laughs> and Latrina um, is, is reiterating in the chat, so no family members can, um, can write recommend uh, letters of recommendation for our scholar grant. It needs to be somebody that's not a family member. But supervisors, yeah, pastor of a church, employers, all those things. This is cool. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for, for being here today. And I just want to remind all of you that we do provide scholar grants. Um, so please go to our website, rankinfoundation.org, and, and check out our our eligibility requirements and some of the really neat things that we're doing too. If you'd like to get involved and, and volunteer, we're always happy to have help. So, um, and then also just a reminder that we have other workshops going on. So we have uh, two workshops that we did prior to this on College 101 and also how to pick a college. And we have another uh, workshop coming up this coming Wednesday, um, November 17th at one o'clock Pacific time. That would be four o'clock Eastern time. And that is going to be all about how to pay for college. So please, 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 you know, join us for those workshops. And then these will also be recorded and posted on our website at rankinfoundation.org. I just want to say thank you so much to everybody who joined us today. I want each of you to know how much I believe in you. We all believe in you. You are doing amazing things. So pat yourself on the back. And I encourage all of you to please, please, please use the worksheet that we, we provide. It's also um, available on our website and go and have a great time learning on you know, how to manage your time better. Thank you so much.